All right. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce tonight's presenter, John Cataloni. John has been collecting fossils since he was 12 years old in Rockford, Illinois, which is very rich in Ordovician fossils. John's passions for fossils led to a 32-year career as an earth sciences teacher. John's interest in Ordovician fossils in the Platteville Formation started with mollusks and soon uh, focused on nautiloids. With more than 40 years of fieldwork and research, John is an expert on the upper Ordovician nautiloids of the American Midwest. John is a member of several fossil and mineral clubs, including the Mid-America Paleontology Society, MAPS, Ascone, Dry Dredgers, and Cedar Valley Rocks and Mineral Society. So without any further ado, I'm turning the floor over to John. All right, now I'm going to see if this will work. Uh, share. Can you all see it? Yes, yep. but it's not, but it's in desktop mode. It will be in presentation mode presently. <laughs> Sorry. Come on. There you go. Very good. As McLeod used to say. So I, everybody can see it now, right? We're, we're good? Yes. Okay, because, you know, this is computer stuff. I don't understand any of it. Well, what we're going to talk about today is uh, the upper order division formation. Um, and Catherine is right. Rockford, Illinois, is really just surrounded by Ordovician. Unfortunately, it's mostly of the Galena Formation. <laughs> but I got interested in Platteville for reasons that will become obvious when I, I talk about uh, the different uh, places. Anyway, um, here is some initial remarks. Um, I wish I could get rid of the screen up here. Anyway, uh, we're talking about the, about different names. The names have changed. The rocks are the same. I always say that. Platteville Limestone and Platteville Group. Named for, obviously, Platteville, Grant County, Wisconsin. The type section is along the Little Platte River. Well, that's cool. But there are more accessible exposures along US 151, five and six miles southwest of Platteville. Uh, and it's pretty hard rock on that, uh, on that road cut. Uh, Platteville rocks contain a diverse and abundant fauna. Clearly, that's why people are interested in it, because there are fossils ab very abundant. Now, terminology. It was termed group in Illinois because we did extensive studies on the quarries we had and the sections we had and subdivided the Platteville into multiple formations and members and stuff. So our Platteville was at a higher, tax, not taxonomic, but uh, uh, level of uh, stratigraphy than the other states. Well, that caused some problems. So Dennis Collada, who is without any question, the number one Ordovician uh, scientist, worker, expert in the universe. And he decided that Let's take the ranks and put them in line with the other states. So he placed Illinois stratigraphic rank in agreement with Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa. They consist now, the Platteville Formation consists of five members in ascending order, Pecatonica, Mifflin, Grand Detour, Natusa, and Quimby's Mill. Now, is that Quimby's Mill or Quimby's Mill? No, it's Quimby's Mill. But in the process of making a name, the apostrophe was lost. It's actually named after Quimby's Mill, mill owned by Quimby. There you go. Uh, for those of us that are not uh, adept at the uh, geologic timescale, here's the Ordovician that we're going to be talking about. And we'll be talking about the early, late Ordovician here. Now, this next slide is going to be busy, so I'll, ex I'll try to do my best to explain it. If there's questions, let me know. Okay, I've got three charts here. 
On the left is the one that Dennis Collada changed the stratigraphic ranks for Illinois. So St. Peter, Glenwood, Platteville, Decorah, Galena, and Maquoga all became formations. In Illinois, they used to be called groups. Okay. Notice that there's only one group, the Ottawa here. Well, the Ansel, uh, but that goes down further even. Um, and then everything else is formations here. The members, uh, you, you recognize a lot of these names, Bra uh, Brainerd, uh, Fort Atkinson, a lot of trilobites in those guys. Wise Lake, the, the, the number one, the number one unit for fossils in the Galena by far. Uh, the Decora is now considered a formation by itself. Okay, so what I've got here in colors, aren't they pretty colors, uh, is we're going to deal with the upper Ordovician, the Sanbian stage of the of global stages. They had just done this when I attended the uh, conference uh, for the Ordovician in Las Vegas. What did we have fun there? Well, what stays there stays there. It's the most, whoops, I'm sorry. There we go. Uh, the Mohawkian is the North American uh, 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 series, and you'll you know you've you've heard me talk about Mohawkian before, and I will talk about it again. And then once again at uh, at Las Vegas, the Turinian and Chetfieldian became more common. Uh, these are brand new names. Uh, those of you that are familiar with the Cincinnatian, you know the Adenian, the Maysvillian, the Richmondian, you know all those well. Uh, at the same rank are, are the Turinian and the Chatfieldian. They are separated by the Milbrig K. Bentonite. And I'll show you the Bentonites in just a bit. And I've always had a problem with that, uh, as, as, as you will see. On the right is from Dennis Kalan and uh, who was it? Uh, I can't think of the other uh, scientists. They did a a, a big study of the Platteville and Galena in Illinois. And this is the chart that they had. In red, I've put the most fossiliferous units. Uh, in the Pecatonica, it's the Dane formation, or uh, Dane member, which I'm not going to talk about. Uh, the Mifflin is, they took out all of the, at that time, members and now beds. They took them all out because the Mifflin is just so uniform throughout the whole uh, section. And then the Grand Detour has the Cowan and uh, the, the mighty Forreston. When I show you the Forreston, those of you that haven't seen these slides are gonna be, are gonna be amazed. Now, the ranks are the same, but as you'd expect, the names have changed to protect the innocent. And here's Wisconsin. And I got used to this real quickly being because I, I, I collected a lot in Wisconsin. Pecatonica stays the same. Quimby's Mill stays the same. But all the good stuff is the McGregor formation. In Wisconsin, they call it the Mifflin subformation and the Magnolia subformation. Okay. The Magnolia contains the Grand Tour and the Natusa. Now, it does get a little bit confusing, but fortunately, if you look at the Mifflin, you'll see uh, shots that I have of it. It's, it's pretty pretty obvious. Pecatonica is what it is. Now, notice at the top of the Pecatonica, they've got a very strange symbol. And I'll show you that in great and glorious detail. Also here, above the Mifflin, they have another symbol that represents K-Bentonites, but it doesn't go all the way across. And I'll tell you about that in just a bit. So here we are, Platteville Formation. And here's a super section that I took a picture of just when it was at its peak weathering in a quarry in Ogle County. I've been going there since 1974, before most of you were born. Take a look at this beautiful section here. Pecatonic and Mifflin. 
are characterized by having a lot of clay. That's why the color, the, the gray color. Get up into the Grand Detour, the Nuchusa, and for the most part, the Quimby's Mill too. Uh, and it's more buff colored. There's less clay. But notice this right here. There's what is termed, and I know these are bushes, but it's termed in, in science, the grassy layer. What it is, is a cave bentonite from a volcanic ash that has been weathered, it weathered to a bentonite, and then it weathers into a clay soil where plants take up root and you can see it. Now, not every section, not every section of the mifflin has this, uh, but this one and the one at Liceville that I'll show you is particularly uh, prominent. It is unnamed. They haven't named this uh, this butt night because they were so concerned with the dike and the mill brig. Okay, industrial remarks number two: the lithology. Uh, Dola stone is, and I got, and I got a map, of course, to show you this. Dola stone is mostly on the on and east of the Wisconsin Arch. Okay, limestone is mostly on the west flank and west of the Wisconsin Arch into. Uh, Iowa, Western Wisconsin, Iowa, and Minnesota. Members differ by shale and clay content. I remember Dennis Collada once saying, and some, and, and there's there's sections where you can really see this. He said, and remember we're talking uh, about the old uh, ranks. He said, John, he said, uh, if you look at these at these sections, you'll see more variation within a formation now called members than among between the formations. So it's a repeated cycle, not quite a cycle of them, but a repeated cycle. And that's what makes it so hard to identify. And here's the, the map. You can see the Wisconsin Arch. Here's the Dolostone section, limestone section, uh, Mifflin the, in Wisconsin, which, yeah, Mifflin was named after his, is, is originally limestone. Uh, Dickieville, notice that Oglesby, uh, on the uh, 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 Peru monocline, which you can see along the, the Vermilion River uh, at, at, uh, at Matheson Park, is a limestone. But just down the road, essentially, uh, Lee Center is a dole stone. So is Leaf River. So is Beloit. New Glarus, which I got. <laughs> There's a really, really interesting story about new, the New Glarus quarry. I'm not going to go into it now, but let's just say that if you want to go to the New Glarus quarry, Bring your your uh, visa card because it's a shopping center now. Yeah, uh, the fauna contains a diverse, abundant, and well-preserved fauna. That's what caught when I started collecting the the Platteville. I'm like, wow, this is cool. Mollusk, brachiopods, trilobites, bryozoans, corals, and thanks to Dennis, echinoderms. We know about the echinoderms now, termed the Goniosteris fauna. Why is it termed that? Well, there's two genera in this family, Goniosaurus for the Platteville and Lambiosaurus for the Cincinnatian. Only two in this entire family. Uh, stratigraphic relations and correlations rests unconformably on the Glenwood or St. Peter formation. Sometimes the Glenwood's there. Uh, you can usually tell the Glenwood from the St. Peter because the Glenwood has a lot of glauconite, so it's greenish. And even I can tell that color sometimes. It's separated from the overlying decor formation by the world-famous, highly acclaimed, and important, my favorite, the Dikey K. Bentonite. I love this little guy. Anyway, correlations. In, in Michigan, Indiana, and New York, it's called the Black River. In fact, the whole thing used to be called, before they changed to Mohawkin, used to be called the Black Riverin. Okay. High Bridge in Kentucky and the Stones River Group. I think it's a group in Tennessee. So, yes, this stuff is all over. Um, uh, Bob Fry did, uh, uh, did a, a, a monograph on the uh, nautiloids of, uh, I think it was the Stones River or maybe the High Bridge or both, uh, showing that they're very similar to the, the Platteville. In fact, he used, he used my... Uh, paper from uh, uh, from the Minnesota thing uh, to show that. Now, 
here's some things that, that, that is important to know about how they determine uh, where, where certain strategies are. They rely often on bentonites. Okay, what are bentonites? I'll show you a nice little diagram on uh, volcanic er eruptions. These volcanic eruptions down in the uh, Alabama area, uh, it was a subduction zone making the Appalachians uh, blue uh, volcanic ash into the air. And remember, as you'll see, we're in the Southern Hemisphere now in the Ordovician. So our winds go differently. They don't go from west to east. They go from east to west, which brings the bentonite in. Well, also notice this beautiful road cut. Isn't it beautiful? It's got different rock layers. It's got, this looks like, you might say to yourself, well, that looks like shale. I bet there's fossils here. You're right. It's a decora. This is the Plantville. I bet there's fossils there. You'd be right. But the most important thing is circled. It's this, the dikey bentonite. Here's the Plantville formation, which used to contain the Caramona member. It doesn't anymore. The dikey is the boundary between the Platteville and the Decora. And the Caramona, even though it's dolostone or limestone, is now part of the Decora. Okay. Now, you might say to yourself, self, you mentioned something about the Millbrig, which is so important. I did. Let's go back one. You see this right here? The Millbrig is in there. I defy you to find it. Okay, what you have to do is hopefully find about the level and then take a vertical shovel and start shoveling and making it a section. You may or may not find it, but that is the boundary between the Turinian and the Chatfieldian. It's a major, major, major boundary, which I always disagreed with. But who am I? Just a silly old retired science teacher. So here's the dikey. And over here are a couple of pieces that I got. And here they are. I've got the dikey from two sections. This one, and I was allowed because uh, when we were at the, on the field trip uh, for when they introduced these, these bet nights to uh, at the GSA uh, me, uh, meeting, when, when, my, when my paper was published, um, Bob Sloan, who for some reason just loves science teachers. And he said, John, he said, you should have a sample of the bentonite here at Shadow Falls. This is where we first found it. Well, there was hardly anything left, but he, he dug out for me a sample. He says, this is for you because you will show it to your science uh, students. I said, yes, Bob, I will. And so I've got two samples of it and uh, uh, trying to get it now up at Shadow Falls uh, you'd be arrested. <laughs> now, I've got two... Uh, uh, can I ask you a quick question? Yes. Where's the Fort Atkinson and the Brainerd now? Are those gone? Oh, there's stuff in the Brainerd. Uh, I, I've just mentioned, and, and I do I do a, a program on the Bentonites, uh, but uh, that, that, would, that would be just too much. But there is... No, do those formations still exist? Oh, I'm sorry. Those formations still exist, and and that one, that one diamond. Well, I, I can't go back that that that. No, that's well. all right. I just so yeah. they're still round. Oh, Brainerd and 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 uh, are, uh, what's the other one that has the trilobites in it? Those oh, Brainerd has Brainerd has good uh, uh, good bryozoans and and some nautiloids and, and trilobites. Um, that's, that's part of the Makokota. Yeah, yeah, it's part of the Makokota, and the Makokota is now a formation. Instead of a group, again, it, they've uh, been changed. This is this. It's like uh, uh, you know, the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Um, that's what happened. But would be names are the same. The ranks are different, and the rocks are still there. Uh, so all of the all of the Makoka rocks that have you know the trilobites and stuff in, and there's quite a few trilobites in in that, uh, are still there. Um, the uh, Galena. Uh, remember, it's a recovering fauna because right here at the dikey, there was a, a, a regional extinction or, or outage, uh, people like to call it. 
And when you go up into the Decora, what are you going to find? You're going to find several varieties of bryozoans, some brachiopods, and by the way, what's really cool, you'll find lingula brachiopods, some of them that big. And that's very unusual. Uh, Tom and I found uh, at a different section of the Decora, we just kept finding lingula after lingula, and it was really cool. But some big nautiloids, not very interesting. Uh, that's all there is. It's a recovering fauna into the Galena, still into the Makoka, although it's getting a lot better. There's a lot of different varieties of mollusks and echinoderms and trilobites. Uh, and then in the Silurian, it, uh, after the, the big extinction, uh, it then picks up. So now you saw this beautiful road cut. Well, uh, Google has, I'm sure you're familiar, you get to a map and you see a road and you think, and you see uh, you have the satellite view. And it looks like there's a, there's a road cut there. So you go to the road level. And they have cameras on, on cars that go through and take pictures. Well, this beautiful, this beautiful road cut now looks like this. You'd be hard-pressed to find Decora at all. Uh, I looked at a close-up, and because this was... Uh, shale and, and allowed the water to percolate through. And this rock was very fractured. Uh, the dike has been uh, simply uh, washed out. It's not there anymore. So as with the other quarry, I'll uh, the quarry I'll show you, if you find a site that you think is very important and gives you fossils, collect it. Don't wait, collect it. You never know what's going to happen. Okay, the depositional environment of the Platteville, shallow, warm water, open marine carbonate platform. In other words, good circulation, good oxygen. The animals were getting high on oxygen, as some of us have been. Well oxygenated waters with normal salinity, referred to as the Mohawkian Sea. That just is such a cool name. In situ shell accumulations, occasional high energy storm events uh, located in the Southeast Trade Global Wind Belt. Now I've got diagrams on these. Occasional influx of volcanic ash forming betonite beds. Okay, here is the paleogeographic map. Here's Laurentia, us. Here's us and Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Arch, the Southeast trade winds are bringing the vol volcanic ash from the Taconic Orogenic Belt into us, all the way up. The hurricane tracks are now going to the Southwest, right here. Kind of neat. And yes, they did get hurricanes. And some of the storm beds we get are from the hurricanes. Some are turbidity currents, but most of them are from the are from the hurricane tracks. Notice that the hurricane tracks do not start at the equator. They can't. There's no Coriolis effect there. Now, some of you might think Coriolis effect. Isn't it the Coriolis force? No. In space, there is no curve. These will be going straight. Coriolis is a fictitious force. It's a non-inertial force. The earth is rotating. It's not inertial. These things appear to curve. Okay. So, but hurricane tracks uh, start about five, 10 degrees away, and then they come in and, 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 and hit our area. And this is land. So they bring some, uh, some stuff in here. Again, Taconic Orogenic Belt, Iapetus Ocean, Yabba Dabba Doo. Now, here's a cross section from uh, the, the Southeast where they're making the Appalachian Mountains. Boom, 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 boom. Taconic Foreland Basin, volcanic, boom, boom, boom. And here comes the volcanic ash. Now, one more thing about the uh, Dikey and Millbrig that I, I have a, a, a problem with. It's been proven, and I've got a graph in my in my uh, 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 Betonite uh, uh, program that shows that the Dikey is one massive eruption. The mineralogy shows that. But the Millbrig is three independent eruptions. 
Well, what would you like better for your big boundary? A single super eruption that has a beautiful bentonite that's orange? I mean, come on. Or the Millbury? Well, no. Yeah. The Ganyasaurus fauna, exceptionally diverse and abundant, as I mentioned. Uh, the, the, the main ones are actually articulate brachiopods, uh, ostracods, ostracods, <laughs> who cares, and trilobites. The mollusks are particularly diverse. Gastropods, 28 genera, 34 species, uh, including one with a certain name on it. Pelosopods, 14 genera, 20 species. Nautiloids, of the published taxa before Bob and I are going to publish our thing, 28 genera and 50 species of nautiloids. Now, real quick, that should tell you something. Are nautiloids predators? Well, if there's 50 species of them, they're going to be eating everything in sight, including each other. So no, not all nautiloids were predators, but that's for a different program. Rhizones, ostracods, echinoderms also present. This is Ganyasaurus, what the what the fauna is named after. It's a very unique uh, flatfish type of nautiloid. Um, it has wings, whereas Lambiosaurus does not have wings. It just has this center part for the Cincinnatian. And because it's so unique, that's why they named it the Ganyasaurus fauna. Now, let's talk about each of the, uh, well, the important ones are going to, we're going to spend a lot more time on. Pecatonica, basal member of the Platteville, named for the Pecatonica River in southwest Wisconsin. 20 feet of pure thick bedded dolostone limestone. Consists of six beds, fossils, generally less fossiliferous than the rest of the Platteville. And the we, we did find some at Dixon, and the problem was the fossils had the shells on. You know, it's nice to have shelled fossils, and I'll show you those from the residuum, the, the uh, Lagerstein. But in the, when they're in limestone or dolostone and you try to get them out, it, it's just not going to happen. So um, the Dane bed is locally fossiliferous, and that's what we were in at, at Dixon. Now, this is really cool. I remember Dennis telling me when he was when he was first writing me, yes, writing you know, on a piece of paper uh -huh, and sending it by mail. That the uh, the the top of the pecatonica between the pecatonica and Mifflin is a widespread ferruginous corrosion zone. Okay. Sure, Dennis, we'll go with that. Well, at Dixon, it was in full bloom. And believe me, on a hot, humid summer day, you could smell the iron halfway across the quarry. It was overpowering. And this is it. This is the famous Frugan's corrosion zone. Here's another uh, example. Did you take a sample of that? <laughs> no, I didn't want that stuff in my house. And I should have because don't go to Dixon trying to find it. It's gone. They took it all out. Don't know why. Now, the famous Mifflin member, named for Mifflin, Iowa County, Wisconsin, uh, 15 to 20 feet of fine grain, thin bedded shaley carbonates, generally is considered the most fossiliferous unit of the Platteville. However, what kind of fossils are you talking about? You see, but generally it is. Shell partings are very common. Occasionally, believe it or not, and this was written up in, in the Journal of Paleo, not by me, but by two guys that uh, uh, Chris Kozar and I had there at the uh, at the, the quarry I'm going to show you. And we were finding graptolites and, and, and other stuff, and the, they wanted to see it. And, they, and, and, and of course, I mean, it was sporadic. And when we, we took them there, we couldn't find it. So I had a bunch of stuff, and I gave it to them. Uh, the top of the Mifflin is often marked by an unnamed K. Bentonite, as I showed you. Uh, four faces are recognized. This is a real, uh, and, and uh, in my, uh, yeah, anyway. The Dolostone is the most commonly encountered facies, which for me, 
yes, I can get my just, you know, tap the rock, out comes the nautiloid. Tap the rock, out comes the gastropod. And the Fenimore facies, a rare, uncommon facies that is just bizarre. And I'll show you that in a minute. Then comes the residuum phase, uh, facies that contains the concentrate lagerstat at Dixon, and it used to be partially at another quarry, and that's gone to, and then limestone. So four facies of the Mifflin. Okay, believe it or not, these are graptolites on Dolestone uh, from the uh, uh, Butler Quarry, or Lee Center Quarry. Um and apparently they got them off of here and they, they are three-dimensional because that was the name of the of the paper, three-dimensional graptolites, blah, 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 of the Ordovician. Um, I can't think of what year it was, uh, but uh, it's in one of the big, uh, all right, anyway, you, you just, you can Google it. Uh, and here is the quarry that it came from. Okay. And this is the Mifflin member. And look at this beautiful section of the of the quarry, the Mifflin. Most of the fossils came from the gray area. Some came from here. And you can see when they shot, there's beautiful rock laying around. This is a very sincere quarry. Nothing but sincerity as far as the eye can see. It was my best Mifflin quarry. If it's a new species and it's Mifflin, it probably came from the Lee Center Quarry. Lee Center Quarry, 2015. Fortunately, and I know some of you are gonna are gonna say this this guy is is wackadoodle. Well, you all know that anyway. I was at the Lee Center Quarry over 200 times in my career, starting in 1973. I went there in the spring break of of class. 1973, they let me in, and the rest is history. Um, I was there, in fact, I was there the day they were taking all the stuff out, because when you let a quarry uh, uh, fill with water, you can't have any debris at the bottom. They cleared out all the, 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 the branches, all the rock and stuff, put it on the, on the top, and I was collecting while they were doing that, uh, and found an incredible piece of rock that was chock-a-block with uh, mollusks, but of course it had weathered so much it was breaking all down. But I found one Macleroides gastropod that had the operculum attached. I mean, that is so rare. It's rarer than my nautiloids. So, ladies and gentlemen, you find a quarry, they let you in, go to it. Now, this is an interesting quarry that I'm going to talk about when I get to the Grand Detour. Uh, in the in 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 the 1970s, uh, uh, Kathy and I went to Dennis uh, Claude as we all and we did often, and we started talking. He says, "Did you ever go to Lightsville, uh, Illinois?" Now, why would I go to Lightsville? He says, "Because I go west of Lightsville around the, the two curves, and there's a beautiful road cut there with good fossils." I went there for my dissertation about 10 years ago. So what the heck? We were there at Leaf River. There was an, a quarry there, so I went up. Uh, we went up to the to uh, Liceville. No road cut. The owner had made a drift quarry, and this is the quarry right here. What's a drift quarry? The level of the quarry floor is essentially the level of the road, because what you do is you go into the hill. There's a hill there, and you go into it. No need to dig deep. Well, you'll see that they did eventually, but this is it. Uh, no, I did not take this uh, when I first started. A, uh, I didn't. I didn't get good pictures of it because there were no digital cameras in those days. So this is 2008. You can see it's weathered. Pectonica Mifflin. Remember this level. See how nice and level and straight it is, huh? Okay. Keep that in your mind. It'll be a while, but keep that in your mind. Pectonica Mifflin. Mifflin Pectonica. Found my first. Sertoserina, siphuncle on the inside of curve, found my first, uh, what will become Vanoceros, the little truncated guy at this quarry. Good quarry. Okay. Here's the Mifflin fauna. Nautiloids, bunch. Gastropods, bunch. 
plus a pods bunch, but less bunch. And then uh, uh, other stuff, brachiopods, trilobites, yes, trilobites. Uh, even the, believe it or not, in, at, 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 at Lee Center Quarry, I got stein currents of trilobites. Yeah, it doesn't happen that often. Oh, it did. Uh, you know, all of your Silurian flexicalamini, or essentially stein currents. Yeah, okay. And then the miscellaneous stuff. 75 genera, 99 species. That's pretty good. Here's the limestone faces at Dixon. Uh, the bend is from the last gasp of the formation of the Appalachians, believe it or not. And here is a piece from Dixon of a limestone slab. Notice what's how what, what's common. Brachiopods, bryozoans, ostracods. Now, I know on here somewhere there's a trilobite. And every once in a while, I actually say, oh, there it is. That is the, um, uh, what do they call those things on the uh, inside of the trilobite? That's what it is of a flexicalamini. No, not a flexicalamini. A hypostome. Hypostome of the trilobite that has the big uh, spines on it. Uh, Gabri Sororis. Yes, Gabri Sororis. See, you guys know more than I do about this. And this is a unique, and, and as you can tell, this was not taken with a digital camera. I digitized it later. This is a unique picture showing the limestone, just plain limestone, next to the residuum. Look at that. It's a facies change. What happened here? Well, from what we can tell, during the Pennsylvanian, the surface of Dixon was exposed to the air. It was sub -airily eroded and for some reason pockets some big some small of this limestone dissolved and formed this residuum with those and i and, and i think mo most of you have seen my uh dixon program the residuum they just the fossils there i swear even even colada when i showed him because he didn't uh uh spend that money he looked for the kind well, a lot of kind of at dixon a lot of kind of uh, and he spent his time on that. He didn't do much with it. And I showed him a, an operculum from McLaurin. He says, wait a minute. He says, that looks like it came from the ocean. But these guys are, are extinct. I said, Dennis, this is at Dixon. And and it was really cool. Uh, here's more right now. What's, what's this? Resume? Why did I put this in here? Well, again, Mifflin, limestone. This was, Dennis can talk his way into anything. He will be able to talk his way out of going to St. Peter. Believe me. He talked the quarry people of, of taking this deposit of residuum and spreading it out to the, uh, to the south of this uh, so that it would weather and we could find fossils there. And we did. But unfortunately, as well, as Tom and Chris knows, I, I don't know if anybody else really was there in the heyday in the 90s, but um, um different parts of the residuum had different things the original alpha site had superb gastropods oh my god they really did once you cleaned them look like they were uh, actual living shells um beta site had beloidoceros where the alpha had none and other things and this site had not a lot of good stuff unfortunately but we were allowed to go there at, at, at will. By the way, uh, uh, Dixon has been totally closed. It's not going to make any more limestone, and it is closed to everything, unfortunately. Dennis is trying to get us in there, but he probably won't be able to. And here's the residuum, residuum uh, fauna. Um, 147 species. And... Not to blow my own horn, but where is that one? Here it is. It was named after me, and it was done by uh, a uh, uh, Swedish uh, scientist, Jan. And he uh, had some from Sweden, too. Dennis cleaned and sent them uh, the specimens I had to them and they made it. it's a brand new 
brand new family, brand new uh, genus, and two species, two or three species. So, yay. But yes, I know the irony. It's a gastropod, not a cephalopod. And I can't name any after me because I'll be an author of the paper. So, yeah, life, eh, this still neat. Believe me, I still really appreciate what they did. Uh, it's from the Journal of Paleo, by the way. You can find it. Now, this is the Fenimore facies. Boy, this, this was, you look at this and you say, boy, they, I can't tell the difference. Well, we were having trouble. Uh, 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 Al Shear and myself and Dennis Collada were there. And we're looking at this and we and, and, and Dennis says, there's got to be some difference. So we went up there was a, uh, on the left here. You can't see it. But there is a, uh, a level of the quarry, a, a, a plateau, and where they didn't uh, quarry all the way down. So he went. He we went up there, and he looked and looked and looked. There are three reentrants here. One, two, and the big one here. So Dennis said somewhere here is the boundary between the Mifflin and the Grand Detour. So I put it at the largest of the uh, other reentrants. But you look at this and you say, this doesn't look like anything that you've shown us before. Yes, I know. This is super thin bedded, lenticular. Uh, and this is not a whole lot different. Uh, and yet it's two, four, uh, two members. Uh, and you get a fauna that is the same, but but limited, as you can see. Uh, you look at all these names. They were in the uh, the, the Dolestone and the uh, Residuum list that I gave you. All the same. All the same. Nothing's different. I'll show you a beautiful Theliops I got from uh, from uh, the, another another one of the quarries that have the, uh, uh, the Fenimore faces. It's really cool because, yes, this combines... There's often time you can get the shell, but there's often times where it's a Steinkern like the Dolestone. So this Fenimore, it just defies everything. Now, fossils collected in Mifflin rocks. Most of you have seen these before, so we won't spend too much time on them. Um, if it's gray, it probably came from Lee Center. Here's Sertoserina crenulata. This is a gorgeous fossil. It came out in two pieces. And it went back perfectly. And what's the difference? Why is this so important? It's the last member of a huge uh, uh, family, a, a group uh, of, of, of uh, uh, nautiloids. It has the siphuncle on the inside of the curve. Almost all the others have it on the outside over here. And look at the crenulations, hence the name. And here is Ulrich Osiris Bloydense with the siphuncal, again, near the middle, but near the dorsum of, of the middle, although it has to be called venture then. Uh, this is Ulrich Osiris, and I've got, uh, I, again, it's not bragging, it's because I collected hundreds of times at all these quarries. I have all but three Ulrich Osiruses. The original, which is pathetic, that was uh, that uh, uh, Russo and Kurt Tykert, I think, uh, wrote, wrote up. There is one in the Milwaukee Museum, and there's one, I think, that uh, uh, that was put in the Field Museum. I think Jack found it and, and put it in there, or Jack find it in the uh, in the Lee Center Quarry. <laughs> so is this. Uh, Tom was with me when I found this, and it just blew me away when I broke this and found it. Uh, Actinosaurus, uh, very common. This is the most active predator. And the ones from the Grand Detour are a lot larger. And uh, think of, as, as I've always uh, uh, thought of this, as the Humboldt squid of the Ordovician. And believe me, you do not want to encounter a Humboldt squid uh, because it has kept people down and let their air uh, uh, expire. Uh, it's a it's a massive, hugely powerful, and has a bad reputation and a bad attitude. Uh, 
the most common uh, genus, Bloidoceros. I do a program on that that I haven't given yet. Uh, uh, now, from the residuum, with the shell on, Zitiloceros bloidense. Zitiloceros has these crenulations that are so strong that they even show as shadows on Steinkerns. When I got to Dixon for the first time in 1990, I'm up there collecting the residuum and I find these two guys and I look at them and I had to sit down. Seriously, I was almost in tears saying, oh my God, this is what they actually look like. This is not a Steinkern. This is a representation, a representation of the actual animal. The way it looked, if you went there, maybe it has some color uh, differences, it would look with these crenulations on it. And that was it. I was at Dixon for, I don't know, 300 times. I'm not sure how many times. Uh, Proteoceros, straight shelled. Uh, Whitfield, believe it or not, Whitfieldoceros is one of the most common nonaloids. Unfortunately, like at Lee Center, most of the time you find just the living chamber. And we call the living chamber cooling towers because it does look, when you just have the living chamber, like one of the cooling towers from a nuclear or coal burning power plant. Uh, and at Dix, and at, at Lee Center, 90% of them are going to be just living chambers. Not at Dixon. You get the whole cabana right there. Uh, Plectosterous oxygen tally, big one. And again, from Dixon, look at the beautiful, uh, Dennis cleaned this for me. Uh, Collada cleaned it for me. This Macleorides, beautiful. You find Macleorides, you find beautiful operculums. Like I said, I showed one to Dennis. But you at Dixon, you never find them attached. I mean, why? That, that doesn't make any sense when this is such a beautiful fauna. But life, that's why I like. Again, the residuum, Dixon. Look at these shells. Hardly any matrix on them at all. If I gave those to a person who wasn't familiar, they would look at the shell and say, what, 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 uh, see, uh, what, what beach did you get this from? That's how good they are. It's, it's amazing stuff. Uh, another beautiful gastropod. I love this one. Cute guy. Uh, another class of spira. Yes, it had markings on it. And I think you can see the uh, some of the re, uh, uh, residual of the markings, even though this is a dolostone. Uh, clams, these are from Dixon, obviously. Beautiful ornamentation. From Dixon, these are monoplacophorans. I mean, these are, look at this. It shows the little mark here, the little bulge where the animal actually protrude. Uh, and this is on top of a gastropod. It's just, these are just super. Um, yes, uh, brachiopods. Yes, lingula. That's a beauty. Uh, and from Fenimore. And when I saw this sucker, Yes, I should get this cleaned off. I, yes, I should. I don't want to. I don't want to hurt my little guy. I'm not a trilobite person. I went there at this one. It's a roadside pit. It's it's no bigger. No, it, no it's smaller than most grade school gymnasiums. And, I, and I'm going back and forth, picking up the nautiloids and stuff. And this is just sitting there. Hi. And yes, I, I picked it up. It's a beautiful, look at the ornamentation. And anyway, and from Dixon, Lager, you know, from the residuum, obviously a crinoid, cupola crassalis. Now, this is one of the crinoids that doesn't have a hold fast. It did, but it broke away and it, it goes like a seahorse until it reaches, I don't know what, a, a, a piece of the ocean has a lot of food or something and jams its stem into the substrate. And that's just as when it died, it simply fell over and it, and it preserved. Wow, this is so cool. On that same rock, I found five other uh, crinoid crowns. <laughs> God, I love Dixon. Now, the mighty Grand Detour member, Named for Grand Detour, yes, in Illinois. Uh-huh. 25 to 45 feet of 
medium bedded dolostone limestone plus clay and shell as you saw it's it's buff colored just a second My cardiologist has me on about a dozen pills. Uh, less clay and shell partings. The Cowan, the, the, there's two super beds in the Grand Detour, the Cowan bed. The genus Onchocerus is hugely abundant. In fact, that's how, well, I'll show you when we get to uh, the Lysfield Quarry again. That's how I identified the rock layer when, when Chris and I went in there, uh, when the quarry was expanded and then abandoned. Uh, the, the the older gentleman had died. His wife knew me. Let me on. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. Um, I cracked a rock. The first rock I found was an, an unpublished Onchocerus. So the chance of finding an Onchocerus like that, and a good size one, I'll show it to you, is rare. And so eventually what, what Chris and I did was excavate. Because it's a drift quarry, it was going up into the hill. Well, so were we up into the hill. <laughs> it's the fad of Richardson Osiris. Now, what does fad mean? First appearance datum. That's the official term. Richardson Osiris, as I'll show you, appears for the first time in the Cowan bed. Plectosaurus occidentale, the big one that I showed you at the, in the Mifflin uh, fossils, last occurrence data last appearance data. Uh, it died out. Forest in bed. Moderate sandy lithology, which is, it. this is, you know, every, every rock group has its pluses and minuses. And the, the minus of the forest in bed, especially at my, at, at Beloit Quarry, what a quarry, is that sometimes you turn the fossil over and there's sand there and it's, it's eroding away. And you only, you know, it, it is what it is. Mollus, brachiopods, trilobites are common. I found a lot of trilobites there with chitin on them. Yes, with the, the yeah, and it's a dolostone quarry. Highest nonaloid diversity and abundance in the Platteville. I'm not just saying in the, no, in the entire Platteville. There was something like in there, 28 different species of nautiloids in one quarry, my best Grand Detour quarry. If it's being published, it's probably from this quarry. So I could have done all my work with just two quarries, Lee Center and Butler. Dixon Lagerstaden, that was just gravy on the, uh, on the uh, pork chop. But yeah, and this is from <laughs> the boy. Get an idea that is pretty fossiliferous. Now, here's the thing, real quickly, and and the reason I do did my uh, or do my uh, onchocerous program. Everybody thinks that in uh, in the artificial, the most common uh, nautilus was straight shelled, proteoceros, uh, or what they used to call Michelinoceros, or what they used to used to call orthoceros. Okay, au contraire, mon ami. If you look at here. You don't see one straight shell uh, uh, nautiloid. The one over here that appears to be straight shell is actually in the same group as these: Beloidoceros, Zitiloceros, Beloidoceros, 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 Zitiloceros, clam. That's a beautiful clam, by the way. Anyway, look at the abundance and look at the lack of straight shell nautiloids. Like I said, I do my program on the Ancosteroids. Uh, which were the most common uh, nautiloid in the in the Platteville, and if it's you know the Platteville, let, let's face it, you know you can get nautiloids in all a lot of other places, but the Platteville had the most nautiloids, uh, and, and Bob Fry agree. Uh, period. Period, in the entire uh, geologic section. Now, here's Lightsville again. Apparently, they convinced the uh, the uh, the woman to let them expand the quarry through the uh, the hill because Cook County had passed a, 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 a law um, banning uh, laying down shots in quarries. Well, if you can't lay down a shot, quarry's useless. Uh, 
Now, you might say to yourself, self, how does that big quarry down at uh, in so Southern Cook County, how does it see, keep doing it? It's part of the deep tunnel project. They can keep blasting and making the, the hole bigger because that's a retainer for floodwaters in the uh, the, the, the great uh, Chicago uh, uh, flood thingy. So they can, they got a, they got a, a, a reprieve. <laughs> well, this, by the way, this didn't work. Okay. But here's what I want to show you. See this rock layer over here? Just to the left of that is where the picture I showed you of the straight bedded Mifflin and, Peca and Pecatonica. Now watch what happens. Same level, same level, same level. Notice the water, same level. It's going down, isn't it? Going into the hill slope allowed these two new groups, and I'll show you a, 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 another one in a minute, forest and common, uh, or common and forest, to be exposed. But that doesn't, this is the north limb of the Leaf River anticline. Yes, there is an anticline in Illinois uh, uh, in the north part, and this is it. You can see up here, that's actually the apex, just purely by chance of the anticline. But as you go along, down it goes. It, the water is a great, you know, the water is at perfect level of gravity. This is it. This is zero. And then it goes down. Now, here's another uh, view of it. Pecker, Mifflin, Grand Detour, Cowan, Forreston. And yes, there's that bentonite again. You can see it growing. The, the, the stuff came down from there and then started growing in here. The Cowan in this quarry is one of the most fossiliferous groups I've ever seen. It's incredible. We were finding, by excavating, incredible stuff. Well, uh, our area is now totally overgrown, and if I and I do a pro, I do a program on that too, and show you how much rock uh, we moved, and it's it's a lot, and the quarry has been sold several times and is now owned by someone who has no interest in letting anyone in. Here is the Grand Tour fauna. Now I I put this down here field collected. Why why did I do that? I want to make sure everybody knows that all of these charts, I've collected this in the field. This is not from publications. Uh-uh. No, I don't do that. If I if I don't find it, it's not in a it's not in my list. It's not. And if I haven't found it, we're not going to put it in the paper when I put the list down. Uh-uh. Some people they may say, well, but but this was found. Not by me. And I can only be, you know, I got to be honest. This is what I actually did find. Again, you might say, well, that's an awful lot, but, you know, I've been collecting for, 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 well, close to 50 years. And um, I was at Lee Center well over 200 times. Uh, the, the original Dixon site was only available for 14 months. I was there 47 times in those 14 months. You've got to be dedicated. And you can, anybody can get, well, not now. All these quarries are abandoned, flooded, closed. That sucks. Fossils collected in the Grand Tour. Uh, this is from the Beloit Quarry. Uh, Sertosphrina cranulata again. This is the first fossil that I found other than the Ancosterus at the Lightsville when we went over across. We were on the west side. We went across to the east side where we were going to excavate. I went on a hill of debris. This was just, it had, you can see it had broken out. This was just sitting there. This is an Ulricoceros, but different than every other one, it's mature. It has a uh, living chamber that has a, a constriction on it. None of those shows that. It's mature. See how the... Uh, uh, step to get closer together that shows maturity this was a find of a lifetime uh, endoceros huge siphuncle camaroceros huge siphuncle isn't that a pretty one 
that came out of it just like that. Uh, somewhere here it broke, and uh, I think it's right here. And I re I repaired. It. Yeah, it's right here. And I repaired it. Yeah, it's so pretty. Uh, this is an actinostris. This is like I said. This is this is a uh, uh, very swift predator. There's probably another uh, old foot and a half, maybe more uh, of apical stuff. It, it was a a big has a small siphuncal, large siphuncal in the apical area, huge siphuncal, and it just decreases. So there's a small siphuncal here. So it uh, has mostly gas in here for maneuverability. Beautiful animal. There it is. That was the first one I found at Lightsville, the first Oncosphorus. And these are different species. I just put two of them together because they're cute. Here's Beloitosphorus, the uh, published species. I've got one more uh, that to, uh, I'll make 10. Now you might, I, I, and I got criticized by this, this. No, these are all published ones. And these are all the ones I found. Now, if you really look at them, they really do all look different. Some are fat like me, some are thin, some are small. Uh, these two, I would question them being in, in blood osteoporosis, but it is what it is. Uh, this is a perfect example of blood osteoporosis, James Valencia. Um we're thinking that, and we'll never prove it, that this and this are all found together. It could be male, female. This would be the male because it's fat like me. And this is the female. We can never prove it. Uh, and here's Richard Sinoceros that pops up in the Cowan. This is from Beloit. This is from South Beloit. See, the South Beloit quarry, um, he wasn't letting people in. My wife, Kathy, went to school with his granddaughter. So we easily got in that quarry and boy, did we find stuff. <clears throat> I'm just saying. Here's the, the uh, plectosterus that is available in the Grand Tour, Robert Sinai. As you can see, it's much smaller, but it's really kind of cute. Uh, here's Salopagostoma again. This is a beautiful, shows the ornamentation the uh, uh, of the uh, flange uh, here at the, at the uh, aperture. Uh, two other gastropods. Halopia is one of my favorite gastropods. This is really kind of cool. And yes, it does have ornamentation on. Uh, here's Clionichia. Now look, look real close. This is a muscle scar. You can't see that on Dixon material because there's the, the shells on it. This is a muscle scar. You can see that on here. And Kleinichi had very big muscle scars. Um, that's what a Steinkern shows you. Now, um, these are monoplacophorans too. You remember the Dixon ones that were so ornate and, and beautiful and small? These are the ones from the Cowan member at Lightsville, but they're a little bit, they're huge. And you can see the ornamentation on. Now, some people say, isn't that just a uh, horn coral? No. And what's the difference? If you look at the inside of a horn coral, it has septa, it has little chambers. If you look at the inside of these guys, there's no inside. It was just guts in there. There's no septa. There's nothing. It's not, that's how you can tell the difference. But these have been uh, have been mistaken, and the ones in at Dixon and other places as uh, uh, horn corals. No, no. Here are the horn corals. Yeah, they're horn corals. Yes, I picked it up for this and I cleaned this out. Yeah, I kept it. There's a trial vice. Boomistoides, I think it's, it's going to be a new species, Graphemi. Uh, Dennis saw this, Dennis Claudia says, oh, this is cool, let me, let me clean it more. Oh, okay, Dennis, go ahead. And so it's, 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 I mean, yes, Steinkern, 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 chitin is what it is. I did get it from, this is from the Blake Corn. I did get a lot of trial advice. And yes, I kept them. Nachusa Quimby's Mill, yawn. Name for Nachusa, Lee County, Illinois. I've never even been there. Pierce, and most massively bedded member, as you saw on that. Ogle County, uh, limited fall diversity. Rocks have been essentially recrystallized. Quimby's Mill, 
named for Quimby's Mill <laughs> near near Lafayette County, uh, Iowa. Fine green, thin bedded with extensive shale partings. Locally, Churty, the kiss of death. Somewhat diverse but uncommon fauna. Concluding remarks. Finally, Platteville Formation, major carbonate rock units of the Midwest. Deposit in warm water open marine platform. Contains, oops, there shouldn't be a D there. Contains an abundant, diverse, and well-preserved fauna. Mollusk extremely, see, you know why I didn't catch that? Because it's spelled correctly and I turned off the grammar. The grammar thing is freaking annoying. So I turned the thing off. Jeez. So mistakes. Mollusk extremely diverse and abundant. The By far the most abundant group. Mifflin and Grand Deter, most fossiliferous of the Platteville. Mifflin, most complex in term of facies. Dolostone, most common. Again, if it wasn't for the Dolostone and getting out the Steinkern nautiloids, I wouldn't have the stuff to publish. No, no way. Wouldn't have come out of anything else. And believe me, uh, the uh, Dixon isn't that great for, for uh, nautiloids. It is for gastropods. Oh, yeah. But not as good for nautiloids. Uh, residual phase contains a concentrate lagerstat. Forest and bed of granite to exceptional nautiloid diversity. And there, as you can see, Collada has a number of papers. This book, which is on PDF, by the way, by uh, Robert Sloan, is where I have my short little paper about the uh, diversity of nautiloids. Templeton and Wilman is the original. And I think this is on PDF also uh, from the Illinois survey, Champlainian series. They did a huge study. It's, um, it is uh, amazing. That's where it got the name Galena Group because they had so much information. And then uh, Wilman and Collada, Templeton had passed, Wilman and Collada redid the Platteville and Galena, but kept them as groups. And then over here, Collada 213 A and B, uh, notes for maps in the Dixon area. He uh, re, uh, revised the, the ranking of the stratigraphy in Illinois. So at least when you say Platteville formation, people know what you're talking about. I remember being up in, in the, at Minnesota at the university. And I said, well, you know, we, I'm getting this stuff from the Platteville group. What's that? No, it's like your Platteville formation. Oh, okay. So now everybody has the same terms. Questions. Oh, I've, of course, I have several. <laughs> I did not. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't expect anything less. The the grassy layer where the plants are growing between yep. the. You mentioned volcanic ash. Yep. Do they know what volcano? I, I, if you said it, I missed it. What volcano? One, no, no, Catherine. The one between the Mifflin and the Grand. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, the Mifflin and the Grand Tour. They don't know anything about that. It's sporadic. Okay. Now, the one for the Dikey, yes, they have identified that. And they actually, I think there's, I've got a map somewhere that actually shows uh, the actual presumed. Remember, we're, we're talking yeah. about a long time ago. Presumed area that the explosion came from. It is, it is considered by many to be the most intense active and proliferant of ash uh, eruption that ever existed. Now, how big is it? Several thousand Mount St. Helens. Uh, it's just, it, it, you just can't believe how big it is. Again, now the, 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 um, uh, Oh, God. Uh, Milberg. The Milberg bentonite is, is different. Like I said, it's three separate eruptions, they know. So, you know, what can you do? Can you find those? Well, you might be able to find 
one or two, you, you may not be able to find the other. You have to find a source region that has the same mineralogy. I don't think they've done it yet. The dikey they did, well, it's easy, the dikey. It has one mineralogy. You know, you go back and, and, and look for it, and you can find the dikey, and it gets sick. It's thin here in the Midwest, but it uh, it uh, in, in Tennessee and Kentucky, it gets to be sometimes almost a foot thick because it's closer to the eruption, obviously. Uh, so anyway, and with all due respect, I'll admit, because it's in a limestone, you can see the Millbrig also. Uh, the dikey and the Millbrig are actually on several road cuts, and you can see them. They're not that far apart. Um, and in fact, in my program, oh, actually, it was on one of the slides here. Let me show you real quick. I think you can see it without me going. Here's the, the dates. Here's the dates that they got. And that, and that was the reason for that big conference in 1987. If you look at the plus and minus, they overlap. You cannot tell radioactively the difference between the dikey and the bilberry. The plus minus brings them into contact. They overlap. So, the only way you can identify them separately is to find them, because yes, they we we know they're separate, but we don't have the uh, uh, the technology yet. Now, the reason for that 1987 field conference or uh, conference at at the Twin Cities, and we had unusually instead of one section, we had four sections on the Ordovician, unheard of. The reason they had developed a tech a technique called cluster dating and they took these volcanic ashes the dikey mainly from various places and back in the day if we could get uh back in my day uh a a uh a, a, a date within 10 million years that was pretty damn good now back here we were getting within a, mo a million years that's real good by cluster dating it, they got it within 100,000 years. That was totally unheard of. So the original, when they originally came out with, and of course we have better techniques now, that's why the numbers are different. The, 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 the number was 454.1 million years. And that was unheard of. So the entire conference well it was it was more than that obviously but centered around our ability to have more precise radioactive dating and they didn't use uranium they used argon 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 39 argon 40 uh is a much easier a much better way of doing it um anyway i digress thank you mm -hmm. john i got a question on the uh Extinction event, you noted around the dikey, correct? Yeah. Do you see any uh, extinctions at all associated with the other bentonites you mentioned? Is there a extinction at all around the mill brig or the no. unnamed? No. Nope. You see any no. faunal changes? You find if, if if you were to if you were to cut that section that I showed you, and not anymore, but if you were to cut that section and say, "Oh, see that purple layer? That I don't know. That's the mill brig. Below it." Our bryozoans and lingulas above it are bryozoans and lingulas. <laughs> Same bryozoans. Nothing happened. So the, I don't know why they chose that. I, I really don't. I really don't. But anyway, it is what it is. Um, and and the, like I said, the bryozoans are the same. You get the, the branching bryozoans, but you get, if you've never collected the decora, I hope you can sometime, beautiful uh pre uh, oh, yeah. those flat Zoan, yes yeah yeah now there used to be a quarry uh well they're still there and and it's, and it's hugely deep we uh escorting has been there uh, the Cortland quarry and when Kath and I were first there it was just a flat quarry and they had the Brainerd shale and the other one which I let's see where is it Fort Atkinson uh there uh, and uh, in the Brainerd, which was a, a shale, Kathy and I were finding Praesopora by the hundreds. 
and about half of them had crinoid hold fast on them. Oh. Yeah, cool. In fact, some of them had them on both the top and the bottom, which means somewhere along the line that rhizome got turned over in the uh, in the uh, water, so that it was uh, you know both sides got crinoids. So it, it also says one thing: echinoderms were very, very, very common in the Brainerd. Very common. Uh, were they all crinoids? Were some cysts? I don't know. The chiderms and the chiderm. Come on, it's not like nautiloids. Jeez. Anyway, no, nothing for the for the Millbrook that we can tell. So that and the unnamed one didn't didn't seem to affect the faunal diversity at all. I'm sorry. I, I'm I'm the, you know the, you, you know I'm hard of hearing. So the unnamed one down below the dikey didn't seem to have any effect on the fauna then either. Um. <laughs> Not a lot because the, the Mifflin and the Cowan are very close together. They both have, well, okay, the difference, the difference is, is uh, Richard Sinoceros. There's none in the Mifflin, but they're in the Cowan. Other than that, no, uh, it's, it's pretty much the same. Uh, again, the Cowan has more Oncosauroids, uh, but then the Mifflin has more Beloidosauruses, just Thousands of Beloit ostracists in there. Um, so no, the, the that that bet and I didn't have any effect at all. So it was basically, you know, the dikey was it. And that the dikey was, was it. That was the one that did the damage. And yeah, and that was the original reason Bob Sloan and Dennis Collada wanted to have this um, a conference. It was just a bonus that some of these. Uh, chemo and, uh, and and isotopic uh, specialists uh, came up and said, hey, Bob, guess what? We can get these dating within 100,000 years. He said, really? You're in a part of our conference. Okay. So, but the real reason was was the, uh, uh, the outage. Uh, some people don't call it an extinction because they like to say extinctions are more global. Well, this wasn't. Admittedly, uh, but it decimated. You saw the Platteville fauna. I mean, hundreds, hundreds of species, virtually none crossed the dikey. And that's why he wanted to have these range charts. Uh, Dennis did echinoderms, somebody did trilobites, I did nautiloids, blah, 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 blah. And you could see at the end of the uh, Platteville, <laughs> full very, very few uh, cross the boundary. So it's a major outage. It may be regional, but it's a major outage when you're talking, again, the Platteville is a major uh, faunal diversity uh, locale. It's just chock-a-block, really. So, I, and maybe Jim asked this, and I, I'm not quite completely understanding it in from my brain. But between the the Miffin um, layer and the, uh, I think it was the going bed. Yeah, going bed. Yeah. What was the changes in the environment that caused such a difference between yes. those two? Yes, most likely, it was the fact that the sea actually expanded a bit, and they were further away from the shore. A lot of the sediment was coming in from the, we did, have, I know everybody thinks when you look at, at the Paleozoic that North America was just a, 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 a an ocean. It wasn't. It actually had uh, land uh, up, in, up in Canada mainly. And it was eroding. Uh, and remember, there was nothing there to stop the erosion. There were no plants. Uh, and so if there was a hurricane, it blew stuff in. Well, either the source changed, and a lot of people think the source changed. It went from the southern part, bringing clay in, to the northern part, bringing more pure uh, uh, dolostone and limestone. Uh, not sure. That would be the most logical, that the source changed because of changing uh, oceans. All has to do with the ocean uh, levels and, uh, and, and, and positions of the continents. And that was the change. Now... It was a change in the lithology, but not a change in the ocean. 
the animals stayed the same. They were the same in the Mifflin as they were in the Cowan and the uh, and the Forreston. So it was a, it was a basically a change, uh, probably not a chemical change, probably a a, a sediment change that the uh, that the animals said, I don't care. I'm going to live here anyway. It's a good place. Bob lives right down the road from me. So the animals stayed and uh, and and just the lithology changed. I know it makes, you look at it and you say, darn, it should be different. It's not. There's a bentonite there. It should have, didn't change. It is what it is. That's what makes, that's what makes geology and paleontology so great. You use the evidence. Any anybody that's going to try to do things on the computer or whatever, if you're not in the field, you're doing nonsense. You got to be in the field. That leads me to my next question. Okay. If if there was you know a young person watching this now and understanding that you know the field work is so critical, but we. Well, no, based on field trips and all that, that the ability to do the field work is so extremely limited. Oh, double extremely. What, what do you tell somebody young that's interested well, and they want to be doing what you did yes. for the last 40 years? They can't. Unfortunately. Now, that's not to say that there's not road cuts. In fact, um, a new road cut, it's not new anymore, but you can still find fossils there. A new road cut was open when they when they redid Illinois 2. And 2 was closed a, 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 a while back. I bet it's about 10 years now, maybe more. It was closed for a long time. Uh, and just south of Byron, on the west side of the Rock River, there's a new road cut there. Find a new road cut, stop and collect. In fact, that's in the Grand Detour, not the Mifflin. In the Grand Detour, it's up higher. Uh, uh, now, I heard, I don't know if this is true or not, that Wisconsin doesn't want you to collect on, on uh, their road cuts. I've never been stopped. I've never been stopped. But they probably looked at this gray hair old fart and they said, wait, we're not going to stop with that guy. He's dangerous. Thank you. But quarries, um, how many working quarries can I get into in Illinois? Two. How many in Wisconsin? One. How many did I used to get into? Uh, Illinois was 22. Wisconsin was six. Yeah, there were more in Illinois. Um, but still, these were quarries. Not only could I get it, or did they allow me in there, is that I was finding good stuff. Um, you never know what you're going to find. You, you really don't. I remember just before they, uh, they stopped uh, Lee Center, before they stopped Lee Center, um, there was a little bit of rock left. I asked the guys, could I go in there? I said, yeah, but you're probably not going to find much. So I'm in this, in this little pile of rock. It's a little pile of rock. I take this, uh, this rock that looks good. You know, when you've done it enough time, you can you, you can tell. Crack! There was one of those truncated guys, the ones that have the, the blunt end, like a bullet. Never seen one like that before. First time. First time in any quarry. So I took the imprint thing, and I got it. And we'll, we'll uh, eventually we're, we're probably going to do a separate paper on the. Uh, it's a group called the Ascosteroids that truncated their shell. They say they, they had these long shells, and they said to themselves, "Hey, Bruce, we're not getting anywhere. Uh, why don't we drop off our shell?" Well, that's a good idea. So they dropped off their shell, and they became bullet shaped. And then in the Silurian, they took their camera eye and put it over the body. So they were like a torpedo. And there's some people that think, some people think that the mantle grew over the shell, the outside of the shell, and it actually had fins on it, like a squid hmm. on the side. 
and it was an internal shell. Can't prove it, but there's a theory. Anyway, we're going to do work on that group because I've got a bunch of them uh, that are new. You never know. You, you never know. You, you never know. You, you got to keep collecting. And yes, I really feel bad. I, I want young kids. You see the young kids that, that you, that Catherine, that you get to do these programs. Well, they're doing vertebrates. You know, it's easy to go out in the West and, and lease some land or, you know, with the, or with the government or somebody and get vertebrates. It's easy to do that. Anybody can do that. You know, I, I'm sorry. You may not get a good dinosaur, but you'll get a dinosaur. Um, but back here, it's it's not easy. Um, there's one other quarry that I've always got into, and it's a beautiful quarry. But uh, the person that now runs it doesn't let anybody in. And so Skinny needs to buy a quarry. Get, or, huh? <laughs> oh, uh, that has been done. That has been done. I'm not going to say where, but it's been done. Um, so... You know, um, you need, you would like to have a, uh, active quarries because they keep uh, uh, blasting rock and you can uh, get new stuff. If you have abandoned quarries, you can still get some stuff. And like uh, uh, when me and the other guy was there um, uh, at, at Lightsville, we looked at the rock, we were, you know, that I was, we were, I found that uh, uh, on Costras. And then we looked over there and there's this, here's this rock going up going up like this, the hill. And so we could see the layer right there at the surface. So we started getting, we were getting a lot of fossils. All of a sudden we got to start taking some overburden off. Still getting, I'm throwing the overburden over our shoulder, getting more fossils. As we I got further going, in. Go ahead. I'm going to oh, stop, stop the record. Yeah. Yeah. Make it so. Yeah. And we can do this again. Right. Now, I don't see that option. I'm looking at the more. Sorry, Cap. <laughs> 